Cannabis Common Sense, the show that tells the truth about marijuana and the politics behind its prohibition. Hello and welcome to another exciting edition of Cannabis Common Sense. Uh, tonight we have a, a hip news segment as always, a lot of scientific news in there, and we also have an interview with Ramon Granados, who's in Perth, Australia, uh, on the other side of the world, down under. He is an engineer who's been working with industrial hemp in terms of batteries and other interesting technology. So stay tuned for that. And uh, we'll start out our show as we always do with our infamous dancing cannabis leaves. I feel the force. Okay, our first story tonight is from Virginia. This Tuesday, February 15th, the Virginia Senate approved Senate Bill 391 in a historic bipartisan vote to regulate the retail sale of cannabis to adults 21 and older. Sales could begin as early as September 15th, 2023 at the state's existing medical dispensaries. The bill also provides for the licensing of additional cultivation, manufacturing, retail, and wholesale businesses via the recently established Virginia Cannabis Control Authority. Across the country, cannabis continues to increase job growth. Nearly In Missouri, nearly one out of every 10 jobs that were created in Missouri last year came from the state's medical marijuana industry, according to an analysis of state labor data that was released by a trade group. The cannabis sector added almost 7,000 new jobs, which is about 10% of the 77,600 jobs that the Missouri Department of Labor tracked for 2021 overall. In New York, the New York Office of Cannabis Management Executive Director Chris Alexander expects the state to release its proposed cannabis industry regulations in May, uh, which would open the window for the state to begin accepting licenses in October or November or December uh, Alexander's comment came during a webinar last week during which Alexander said the agency would allow a five to six month window, including a 60 day public comment period in order for stakeholders to assess the regulations and allow for changes by the regulators. Out of Los Angeles, California, trauma patients who test positive for the presence of cannabis upon their admission to the hospital possess a decreased risk of death as compared to controls, according to data published in the journal, The American Surgeon. Researchers with the University of California, Los Angeles, compared in-hospital mortality outcomes in a cohort of over 141,000 trauma patients. Consistent with other data, they reported that patients with a history of cannabis use, as documented by a positive drug screen upon admission, were less likely to die while hospitalized than were patients with similar injuries but no evidence of recent marijuana exposure. The authors concluded, quote, on multivariable analysis, the associated risk of mortality was 21% lower for patients with a positive marijuana screen compared to patients testing negative for all drugs and alcohol. These findings require corroboration with future prospective clinical study and basic science evaluation to ascertain the exact Pathos physiological basis and thereby target potential interventions. End quote. Prior observational studies have similarly reported that marijuana use is associated with a decreased risk of in hospital mortality among patients suffering from congestive heart failure, cancer, COPD, pancreatitis, HIV, burn related injuries, traumatic brain injuries, and various other types of severe trauma. 
This study, marijuana use associated with decreased mortality in trauma patients, appears in a current issue of the American Surgeon. Just south of LA in Irvine, California, inhaling cannabis significantly reduces interocular pressure in healthy subjects for approximately four hours, according to data published in the journal Frontiers in Medicine. An international team of researchers from the United States and Italy assessed the association between THC plasma levels and interocular pressure in a cohort of healthy uh, adults following the self-administration of cannabis cigarettes containing either 6 or 13% THC. Consistent with prior research, marijuana inhalation resulted in a temporary reduction of interocular pressure, and the interocu interocular pressure was most significant for 60 minutes after the subject's normal baseline. For up to four hours, uh, THC plasma concentrations of 20 nanograms per milliliter, but not above this letter level, were most strongly correlated with decreases in interocular pressure. Scientists have long documented that THC inhalation reduces interocular pressure, which is very beneficial for glaucoma patients. According to recently published survey data, over one-third of glaucoma patients have discussed their medical use of cannabis with their oncologists. Glaucoma is typically caused by abnormally high pressure within the eye. Nevertheless, the American Glaucoma Society has not endorsed the use of cannabis as a treatment for glaucoma. By contrast, virtually all state-specific medical access laws specify glaucoma as a qualifying medical condition. This study, the relationship between plasma, tetrahydrocannabinol levels, and interocular pressure in healthy adult subjects appears in this month's edition of Frontiers in Medicine. And even farther south, out of San Diego, California, the detection of THC in blood is not correlated with changes in simulated driving performance, according to data published in the journal of the American Medical Association Psychiatry. A team of investigators affiliated with the University of California at San Diego assessed subjects' simulated driving performance after inhaling either low potency, 6%, moderate potency, 13%, or placebo cannabis. Cannabis inhalation was not associated with any uptick in crash risk. Researchers identified no correlation between subjects' blood THC levels and driving performance at any point during the study. Consistent with prior studies, the authors reported, quote, the current results reinforce the per se that per se laws based on blood THC concentrations are not supported by evidence, end quote. Per se traffic laws make it a crime for a driver to operate a motor vehicle with trace levels of either THC or its metabolites in their blood or urine, regardless of whether there exists any demonstrable evidence that the driver is under the influence. The study, Driving Performance in Cannabis Users' Perception of Safety, a randomized clinical trial appears in this month's edition of the journal, the American Medical Association, Psychiatry. Out of Philadelphia, patients suffering from chronic back pain reduce their use of prescription opioids and report improvements in their condition following medical cannabis treatment, according to data published in the journal Curus. Investigators affiliated with Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia evaluated opioid consumption pattern in a cohort of 186 patients with chronic back pain during a six months immediately prior to and immediately following their enrollment in the state's medical cannabis access program. Consistent with prior studies, the patients reduced their daily intake of opioids over the course of the trial. Over one third of patients who were taking low dose doses of opioids at the onset of the study eliminated their opioid use by the trial's end. Subjects' opioid reductions were associated with improvements in pain scores and in patients' daily functions. The authors concluded, quote, patients with chronic multiskeletal non-cancer back pain who were certified for medical cannabis filled a significantly reduced amount of opioid prescriptions after initiating medical cannabis compared to pre-medical cannabis. Upon medical cannabis certification, Patients with lower levels of baseline opioid use had a high chance of stopping opioid use altogether. Patients showed improved pain scores and daily function scores 
following medical cannabis certification. Our study supports evidence that short-term opioid usage is diminished and potentially stopped within six months of medical cannabis certification, end quote. This study, medical cannabis use reduces opioid prescriptions in patients with chronic back pain, end quote, appears in this month's edition of Cure Us. And uh, also out of, Pit, out of Phil, uh, Pennsylvania, but the other side of the state, Pittsburgh, our last story tonight, and kind of on the same subject, the use of cannabis products is associated with reduction in pain patients' consumption of opioids, according to daily data published in the Journal of Pain Physician. A team of investigators affiliated with the Institute for Pain Medicine in Pennsylvania assessed the opioid use trends in a cohort of 115 chronic pain patients who initiated medical cannabis therapy. The patients in the study suffered from intractable pain and had consumed opioids for a period of at least six months. The majority of the study's participants were between 50 and 70 years of age. Consistent with other studies, the authors reported that patients reduced their daily morphine milligram equivalent intake after initiating cannabis therapy. There is a 67.1% average decrease in their morphine intake. And the, uh, there was a 73% increase of their morphine intake at the second follow-up. The authors concluded, quote, the current study's approach has led to a significant decrement in chronic opioid use for the majority of patients with chronic pain deciding to trial medical cannabis in our clinical setting. Therefore, we present medical cannabis as an alternative, potentially effective class of treatment, end quote. This study, medical cannabis used as an alternative treatment for chronic pain, demonstrates reductions in chronic opioid use, a prospective study, appears in pain physician. That's the end of our hemp news segment tonight. Uh, if you are a loved one is looking for help finding a doctor to certify you for medical cannabis, we are happy to refer you to doctors who can help you all over the United States. So just call our office at 503-235-4606. If you have any questions regarding medical marijuana, you can call and talk to me. Just call us at 503-235-4606. Tonight's interview is with Ramon Granados. He is in Western Australia on the other side of the planet from us. So uh, here's the interview. Stay tuned and help us restore him. Good night. Well, I'd like to welcome our guest, Ramon Granados, who uh, is currently in, down under in Australia. Uh, Ramon and I met at the NOCO Hip Expo a couple of years ago, and uh, uh, we've been talking about working together on various cannabis-related educational projects. But welcome to the show, Ramon. It's a pleasure, Paul. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. This is a great opportunity to share everything that we're doing up here and what we can do in the future. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I know you have a background with a degree in civil engineering and environmental science from Florida Institute of Technology back yes. in 85. And you worked as a, a civil engineer until the past few years. Is that correct? Well, and not as a civil engineer. I I also was trained by the oil and gas industry as a planning and project controls engineer, a career that I basically, it's a career that basically integrates and interface all disciplines in one. Uh -huh. And I've been, I work in that area almost all 26 years of my life. And when did you first start being interested in cannabis? in terms of working in the industry? How did that begin? Well, uh, there is a, there is a, like I said, an interface of things uh, between my private life. Um, eventually when I decided to jump and work for cannabis itself, I have always been an advocate of cannabis. First time I tried, it was when I was 15 years old and I believe I found my girlfriend for the rest of my life. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. 
Yes, yeah. ever, ever since I have been, you know, we were, I guess, like you, Paul, we are soldiers of the, of the prohibition. And somehow we overcome the infernal jail threats of being caught with a, with the, with being, you know, get caught with wit. But I was all, all my life throughout university and the career level as a pot smoker. Um, when you were 15, where did you first try cannabis? Where were you? Um, in high school with friends in the, <laughs> they just put it out and I, you know, when. Was that in Australia or was it no, in Florida? No, that was in Latin America, South America. Oh, okay. What part of South America? In Venezuela. Okay, okay. Yes, and it's very, it's a subculture of the country or basically yeah. not the country, it's everywhere, you know, most Latinos countries are alcoholics. And uh -huh. I was never, I was actually never inclined to be alcoholic. I just love weed from day one. It doesn't mean uh -huh. that I used to drink, but without, throughout the times, um, I learned, uh, about hemp in 2016. And I also learned what this plant can actually do for humanity in terms of medicine. So I, I was working in Amsterdam and I smuggled uh, from Amsterdam to Spain one uh, a bottle of uh, CBD oil for my mama that was suffering cancer and the early early stages of Parkinson condition. And I and was saw, in Spain? That was in Spain, yes, in Barcelona. Yeah. So I So from Netherlands to Spain, you're actually still in the EU. You don't really have any customs to go through, right? It's like now that they've dropped all the border controls, unless you go through Switzerland. Yeah, but yes and no, yes and no. It's not a straightforward formula because um, cannabis is still highly regulated um, in most countries on earth and they tell you no, but it's selected, but, you know, it, it, you never know when you can, it's, it's the law is the law. So even though you can, you know, travel from France or anywhere within the European Union and carry a little bit of oil or, or wheat, at the end of the day, if you ever get caught, it's up to the police that is you know they can get you you never know yeah i understand in france it's particular particularly anti-cannabis they'll even drug test you on the streets at times but um surprisingly in this uh, world of hemp or industrial hemp france is the perhaps the most knowledgeable country on um yeah growing industrial hemp yeah had a a low THC variety. They pioneered the low THC varieties, actually, uh, and and sold it for paper and and currency and and uh, uh, it was, most of it was milled in in Spain. It was turned into pulp and milled in Spain. Was my understanding? Yes, there is a lot of stories about that. So in 2016, I traveled to Denver, Colorado to, to learn about the plan. The first, first time I ever went to NOCO, we met in 2018. But in 2016, Paul, I've got to confess as an engineer, as a human being, as that, that plant impressed me completely out of everything you can do out of the plan. So my universe was um, humbly or, or uh, speaking, and uh, it was just about smoking weed, which it helped me a lot for, because I got, uh, among other conditions in my mind, I got dyslexia and weed helps me to focus a lot and, and it helps me to work. And I don't know, it's my, my mind, it is what it is. <clears throat> but then after I learned uh, about hemp, a couple of years after I quit my career and started that's focusing only on what I can do with the plant. So basically what I have done is transfer my engineering skills to, to this universe and hopefully we will open the eyes that we can do a lot of things with it. 
how did you come to be in Australia? <clears throat> I, um, there was a big um, political unrest in Venezuela. Um, I was basically asked to leave or I die. Um, so my first, uh, I was basically, basically exiled. I had support from, from foreigner countries to help me to get out of, of, out of Venezuela. I got a job in Africa. And since then I've been traveling, you know, I, I work in over 14 different countries designing and building oil and gas refineries. But in when I was in, in Malaysia or Thailand, I don't remember, um, an Australian company asked me to come with them to Australia and I accepted and, and I now I became Australian, I embrace the culture and although I shouldn't say that I embrace the culture because Australian has that, uh, that touch of Latinos where they speak English and Spanish, but it's the same thing. It's barbecue, it's beer, it's, it's the beach. So I didn't really have much uh, um, problem adapting to the Australian culture. Yes. So, beautiful so but marijuana is prohibited in Australia. Does Australia have a medical marijuana program? Uh, yes, we do. Um, that up, right? <clears throat> well, it started a couple of years ago. They, we legalized the uh, med medicinal uh, marijuana for everyone. No, nonetheless, the same problem of the prohibition, the government uh, uh, implemented very strict ways so that the doctors were not able to prescribe it accordingly. So it was like the, you know, very confusing times. Nowadays, it is much um, easier. All you need to do is just call a clinic and then you book a, um, an appointment and, and depending on your condition, you get prescribed. <clears throat> Nonetheless, uh, uh, one of the main problems that the, this industry is facing in regards to the medicinal cannabis is that the price is almost the double of the black market. And generally speaking, the You're black market. Generally... So you can go to the store, but the price is, is higher than the black market. Yes, absolutely. Almost the double. We're running into that in a lot of different states in the United States. Uh, Oregon is not that way, actually. Uh, uh, the the commercial market can, can uh, get the price down. I've actually seen an ounce of cannabis down the street from a local chain uh, that was $19 an ounce, which is the $19 least. $19 an ounce. <laughs> yeah, for, for sensimi of flour. Now, I, I grow my own, so I don't have to go. I didn't go in and look at it, but I mentioned, I took a picture of their sign and I posted it on Facebook and I got a lot of responses. One of my friends, who's also a local activist, John Young, he went to the the local store and he said they had four varieties and one of them was pretty good and he bought an ounce for nineteen dollars. But uh, uh, you tell me this kind of prices, Paul, and it's unbelievable. Was in yeah, Australia. Well, it's, it's the lowest I've seen, you know, since I was a kid in Texas when we had ten dollar ounces. Yeah, that was a long time ago. I'm telling you, <laughs> low grade. Mexican weed in the early 70s when I was 12 and 14. But uh, it went up by the time I was 15 and 16. But uh, but uh, believe it or not, Paul, um, in Australia, most people do not like smoking joints. They like um, smoking bombs. So uh, uh, the minimum, the minimum uh, quantity that it, that uh, you know that you buy in the black market is twenty five dollars Australian dollars, which is just about How twenty. How much is that? Like a one gram and a half. Oh, that's that's pretty expensive. Very expensive. U.S. dollars, twenty five Australian would be about twenty U.S. Twenty U.S. for one gram and a half. But when, of course, when you buy quantity, the prices drop down. You buy a uh, ounce, so you end up paying like ten dollars per per gram. Uh, which is just about six, seven dollars per per gram, uh, U.S. dollars. 
but it's still very expensive, you know, for most of the people. But if you is go black market price or the dispensary black market price, black market. And so the dispensary price is twice that. But the, when you go to the to the legalize, it's the double. Of course, yeah. I I tried uh, actually tried like a, two three weeks ago a friend of mine that uh, he had me tested uh, one of his the strength that he's got from from the circuit or from the from the system, and it was twenty two percent of THC or twenty four THC. That was my mind blowing. Only one. <laughs> That was really good, but and yet very expensive. So it's not reachable for the masses. And when you are talking from the medicinal perspective, <clears throat> then we are not um, we are not solving the problem of the people. Do you have one of the medical permits there in Australia? No, not yet. No, no, no. I haven't. I haven't got it. Um, not because I don't want to. I just haven't had the time with all this sure, work sure. that I'm doing and. Um, so if you have that, are you able to, are patients able to grow their own? No, we cannot grow our own. So even if with a medical license, you have, you can't grow your own, you have to go to one of these dispensaries? Yes, yes. Okay. I believe that this is a problem um, mostly from greedy, from being greed than anything else. I have written many times that it doesn't matter how much the people grows, we won't ever be able to compete with corporations that can have the logistics to reach more people. That's yeah. basically it, you know, so you need both. But if, when you encourage people to grow, then you can create new strains that can actually be marketable in the future. But if you just keep that mentality of fully control of a business, like if you were producing beer or or scotch that you can go all the way tracking where this where the grain is coming and the final bottle yes we can do it but at the end of the day it's not adding any value to to the industry itself this has been a plan that belongs to the people and without this we could have not reached anything that we have been able to 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 achieve in in with the, with the plant so when you just want to, or you think that you can, uh, you know, bring the seed, give it to a scientist or to a breeder, then create your own seed. And then you think that you have, you know, conquer the universe is wrong because this, the seed genetically speaking, it's almost impossible to, to control it. It's the nature of the plant itself. <laughs> so um, I, I don't, it, it is a problem of more, it's greed even though you explain the politicians or the decision makers how the science of the plant itself, there is a reluctancy to accept that this plant is for everybody. Yeah, it's uh, the oldest and most productive crop is the thing I like to keep focusing on. So I know that uh, you're involved in other regional countries as well. Uh, I know you introduced me to our guest just last week, Kimmy Del Prado in, in the yes. Philippines. Uh, tell me about your activities in, in Australia and your work uh, across the region and the world. Well, um, I chose to work with um, industrial hemp primarily because I, I discovered the great potential that this plant has. Um, and moreover, what it can do for all of us. So I embrace it. I learned about hempcrete. And I understood that we still have a long way to go on regards to, to this industry itself. Uh, just to give you an idea, um, when we started building with concrete 100 years ago, and it was it was believed that it was uh, discovered by in, in and, and I'm telling you this is this is really story. A hundred years ago, a, a plant or factory was set up in London. A hundred and something years ago, and through all the years, uh, at the beginning, people thought that it was a factory of the devil because people were bringing bricks and all this. 
so <clears throat> with the time we learned that we were just able to teach anybody in their home to mix concrete. And this was an explosion in worldwide so that we can, so, so that people can start building their own homes with bricks and, and mortar. So um, I, a couple, some time ago, I met Mr. Wolf Jordan, which perhaps is one of the most, uh, most knowledgeable guys on, on hempcrete on earth or lime, so to speak, lime engineering. So after talking and talking, we came to the same conclusion that we are just is, is, is scratching the surface of that knowledge. We, we don't know yet as much as we believe we, we want. Therefore, we still have to do a lot of research and development in, in a lot of aspects, just in the hempcrete area. We're not talking plastic, we're not talking food, we're not talking anything else, not even medicine. We're just talking engineering application. So that has been my journey. And I, I never was interested because of the magnitude of the project that I had been involved. I was never actually interested in building one or two houses, uh, not even a hundred houses, not even close to, to what we can do if we want to energize the supply chain. So um, lately I have been involved and um, working in two smart hemp cities, one that we are intending to build in Thailand and another one in Puerto Rico. And this has been a journey of learning journey for all of us because uh, uh, the coronavirus uh, restrictions and not being able to be it's physically. A difficult time. Very difficult time to be crossing borders and going to different nations. I've done a little of it myself and the testing requirements and there, there can be onerous. And they can, I've had them change in the middle of my trip one time where uh, they went from the test, it was had to be three days in advance. And then while I was uh, in uh, Peru, I think they changed it and it had to be 24 hours in advance instead of three days. Yeah, so very complicated, <clears throat> but it never stopped the team, not the challenge. Uh, this is not, uh, Paul, I've been work like I explained earlier, I, I have been working all my life in very large complex um, uh, oil and gas industry projects. So we have been basically done this all my life. I'm, 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 I'm college, we've been doing it all in the last 25, 30 years. You, you design and deliver projects from one headquarter and you get the people working where they need to work. The hard part is the interface, the hard part is keeping the communication, the hard part is planning and controlling everybody, but, uh, but uh, we have softwares and we have the IT capability and, and the trust of the people that they know what they're doing. Because uh, when you're building uh, remotely, you've got to have a very special uh, touch to manage all those elements together. So um, the physical presence is not as, as important as we believe it is, but it's a change of mentality that we have to embrace because uh, we are not going to come back to the same, same old, same old. This I know. Yeah. You know I, I talk about, go to various countries and talk about the history and uh, hip and the, the various jobs it can create all across the different industries but uh i i tell people that one of the easiest industries our our niches to fall into is hip cream and hip yes. fiber for instance you're going to grow hip fiber you're gonna the farmer has to sell it and so uh you know uh if you're going to make it into textiles there has to be a textile mill somewhere pretty nearby that will take it to make it into canvas or rope or lace yes. or linen or if you're going to make it into paper, you got to have a paper pulp mill yeah, and yeah, mill yeah. somewhere that will take it. But with hemp uh, Crete, you can take the fiber, chop it up, mix it with lime, and start working with it right away. And yes. Making building materials. So you've got a project you've been working on in Puerto Rico, and 
Where else did you say? Oh, we have many projects. Actually, the, my business partner is, um, is building a house as we speak in Sydney, 130 square meters, which is just about 13,000 13, square feet of extension of his house. But um, um, my main role is, uh, you know, the, to be the, pro, the, you know, the project manager of it. So what I do is just interface the architectural, the architectural uh, designs, the engineering required. Uh, we get the subcontractors. We sign all all type of contracts that we need to, um, and I deliver the project. That's basically what I do. I I just recently reported on a news article about how the industrial regulatory agencies are going to start investigating making hemp an approved material building material so up to now you have to get some like a variance or some uh permit if you're you're building your houses to to allow you to use him and so they would say it's a multi-year process but they're working on including hemp in the the next uh standards for for building that is coming up in like two or three years from now it was well, in our news section probably about three weeks ago well there is a and <clears throat> there is a um, something to discuss primarily because what the industry or the construction industry is looking for is to get those standards so we can basically uh, be able to get insurance yeah. So once you get insurance, then you can get the financial machinery to support the growth of the industry. That is basically it. But the realistically speaking, from the engineering perspective, without having the standards and uh, approved, we know that the that the material works. It is proven through history. We know how we to mix it. We know how to to work with it. Actually, in Western Australia, where I live, we have the largest concentration of hemp homes on Earth. That oh, really? Something. But, but it is like most owners on Earth because we don't have insurance. We most owners pay from their own pocket. So this is an industry that is mainly focusing people that have a higher um, uh, capacity to spend money. It's not, it's not um, uh, for social work or mass production yet, because like I said, it is linked to the financial universe and it's linked to the insurance. So that is basically the answer of it. So I'm not that familiar with Australia. I've never been there, but uh, uh, I, I often hear about Nimbin and Nimbin mm -hmm. being a center of cannabis uh counterculture and it, where is that located geographically in terms of well if you if we compare like i am in san diego california so to speak then in being is in new york oh okay it's the total opposite corner yeah You're in the far southwest and it's up in the northeast and no it is close to sydney it is like yeah. two three hours close to sydney yes it's an icon for resistance, I would say, yes. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of, um, I got a lot of good friends that live there and they dedicate their life um, to grow and, um, you know, um, face the prohibition in a daily matter. Yes. So tell me about your work on, uh, on uh, hemp batteries. My understanding is that you've been working in several countries on projects regarding hemp batteries well hemp batteries is not my idea yeah just <clears throat> and just um helping to scale up the project and i lost you paul i lost you no i'm here i'm here i uh, i turned off my camera for just a second there <laughs> uh, so I can do something else. Bill can edit these together. So now yeah, right. he'll edit this out. And I'll just kind of go from the top 
on the hip battery issue. So we we have before I, in 2018 I met Mr. Carl Martel, who is the um, a Canadian a scientist. I met him in Germany, uh -huh. and I since then we've been you know uh, aligning our forces to make this project happen. Well, um, he taught me how to do a prototype here in Perth, which I have been promoting it. But now we are in the scale up uh, phase to to start making a commercial prototype that we can eventually mass produce it. So in this moment, we are in the phase of um, rising capital to do so. Um, this is a mind changing, uh, uh, some uh, mind changing tell, and a game changer, tell, Mr. Paul. To I, yeah, tell our audience and me how hemp fiber can be used to make graphene or carbon based batteries. Because I, I don't know anything about that, and I'd be fascinated to hear some. Well, the process is quite simple. Uh, <clears throat> In order for us to do uh, a house, we need to go into the de decortication uh, process. Uh, to do batteries, we get the same biomass and we uh, we carbonize it. Um, we we convert it into biochar. Biochar is like a charcoal, but with very low uh, oxygen levels and high temperature. So when it becomes brittle then the the, conduct, the conductivity um, properties that him has by, by its own, then you can store energy uh, in it. Um, it is, it is uh, very straightforward. Um, it is uh, perhaps one of the main motivations that brought me into uh, to working hemp, primarily because what I envision that every infrastructure that we build, everything that we we do with hemp, we can we can have a battery in in uh, as part of the construction. I don't see building tons of houses, thousands of houses, if we don't have the battery or we are not able to harvest energy from it. So the what I'm promoting is to have <clears throat> an architectural design for each one of our solutions where you can have solar uh, solar roof uh, and or windows that can capture and, and store the energy or uh, transfer the energy into electricity and we can keep the storage of the energy in our hand batteries. It is quite simple. Uh, of course, the battery itself is complex in many ways, uh, but rather than using lithium, we use uh, hemp. And it's yeah. proven just, that it's almost 200% 200% more performance than and, any other battery. And lithium binding is very environmentally destructive. It's, uh, yes. you know, it, it's often done in, in uh, areas that are, are arid and uh it, it's very toxic and usually uh its production has somehow poisoned indigenous areas in latin america and here in the united states i know and we're here in australia too fighting lithium yeah. mining in northern nevada right now some native american people yes i agree with this um um but if I may, Paul, it's not just a fact of how we manufacture or process the lithium. It's just that like once the utility life is gone, you can recycle it. In, with, with our batteries, you can recycle. You basically, with one of the things that calls more my attention uh, working with hemp is that we can not only create a self sustainable market, but create a circular economy of our own. It's just not about <clears throat> competing with an old uh, agonizing world. It's just what we need to conquer a new world with new products based on him. An old or friend of mine who's dead, who, I, who I, I talk about fairly frequently, Gatewood Galbraith, said it was a, com, a, 
a conflict between the natural cycle and the synthetic cycle. And so the petroleum products, the, 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 we are going farther and farther away from the natural cycle. And obviously, we're changing the, the world's weather and uh, poisoning our environment, deforesting the globe. And, you know, hemp at least can stop some of that and, and help us try to begin to remediate and save uh, the, the biodiversity, which I think is our most precious inheritance and legacy. And, and we obviously haven't done very well with it in our lifetime though it's difficult for any individual to uh, to say they really own that. But uh, as, a, as a species, obviously, uh, we've lost a lot of other species under our watch here during our lifetime. So I know him can change that, and I'm glad to see that you're working on that. Tell us more about it. Um, Paul, there is um, a statement or a phrase of Jack Harrer it said a long time ago, and these resonate every single day that I have been working uh, for hemp. It is hemp is the solution. This is it is not um, it is this is not a slogan. This is not something to sell. It is a fact that we need to embrace in a in a daily life. It is good for clothing. It is good for construction primarily construction. All we need to do is just grow to grow to build our homes. Oh my God, well, well, how bad is that? <laughs> I, I like to grow it for the flowers myself. Uh, you know, uh, I, I'm pretty good at that. And so uh, this past year, I, had, uh, I used to have some help, but now I'm just doing it more and more myself. You know, I've got my half brother kind of helps water when I'm not around, but uh, that's about all. Outside of that, I've been it's been all hands on this past season. Hopefully, we can I can keep doing that. But in parallel to my engineering uh, aspect of my interest to spend or invest my time or my efforts and money, and I do have a hobby that I learned also uh, a skill that I that it was dead. I would say I. When I was a student, I used to enjoy very much organizing events. Um, actually, I was the president of the uh, American Society of Civil Engineers when I was a student, and I helped to organize a 700 uh, people conference from engineers from, uh, and students from all over the state of Florida. I see. And yes, and then when I joined the hemp industry, I basically started helping in parallel to the engineering. I started working, organizing, organizing events. So this hobby has become a, so a business. Tell me how, how you, I, I know about, tell our audience about the Green Tigers Journal. And I know it was the uh, Green Tigers that uh, you and I first, uh, I first met and talked with uh, our guest from last week, Kimmy Del Prado in uh, yes. the Philippines. Tell our audience about Green Tiger Journals and your effort on these events. Yes, Green Tiger Journal is perhaps uh, one of the dearest baby. Uh, Johan uh, Muhammad in Malaysia and I founded this company with the intention to become an influencer or in 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 the different countries that we have a, a association with, um, countries that have already legalized or are in the process of legalization, so um, we decided to found this uh, newspaper or media to support and to interconnect all those countries in a general effort. Then we brought uh, Kimi, that has been a gift for all of us, she helped us to organize and do every, everything that needs to be done. We still know, we know that we still have a long way to go to reach where we want to reach. Uh, we want to have a um, multi, um, multi, simultaneous translation 
in the post that we do in different countries. Um, but uh, so far, uh, the, the organizing event has been the main focus. It has helped us to connect. It has helped us to, to, to bring so many beautiful minds, such as yourself, Paul, and hundreds of others um, pioneers that, that are putting their energies for this to happen. This is so intense to translate or to express that the individual efforts that we're doing in each of our countries is basically the same effort in a global scale. What you're thinking is the same thing that a person in Mongolia is thinking. It's no difference. We're just trying to bring uh, capitalism ideas or practices to, to grow in a global scale when I believe it, the answer is more collaboration. The way I see him, it is, it is not, it is not, um, it is not a matter of competing, but to collaborate and bring in the technologies that we're able to achieve to, so that we can all grow together. The same problem that, that a farmer has in Tennessee is the same problem that a farmer has in Zimbabwe. And, and, and the only difference is that there are more resources, more knowledge in the, parent, in the farmer in Kansas than the farmer in Colombia. It is just a matter of bringing all this knowledge and help each one of us to, to create a new world because when you, Let's let's analyze the just the construction aspect of it. You know, if we want the main interest in this moment is to is to grow for construction. So when we bring hemp into the equation, all we need to do is mix it with lime. In like in United States, you don't mix it with lime. You also mix it with cement, and you also mix it with sand which is basically re replicating, replicating the same problem. We don't want to use sand. The bank sands are dying. And it has been primarily the responsibility of the construction designers of the business that we keep using sand. And when we use cement, the binder behind the cement is lime. It's not- yeah. Which so is powdered limestone, basically. Yes. So, which is a very common geological stone out there. Limestone it is- It is. My brother, this is simply bringing uh, the fundamental, um, the fundamental technology, and then we can grow from it and learning more what we can do with it. Uh, so far, uh, I embrace what we are doing in many countries, primarily in the United States, that they are doing an extraordinary job. A week ago, one week ago or two weeks ago, they submitted the standards for for hempcrete, which is fantastic. But once again, this standard approval is only, will benefit only the financial aspect of it or the insurance. It will not benefit the people because the technology is so simple to use that we don't really need banking except to lend the people so they can grow, so they can build their homes throughout the proper, you know. Right. But bringing the financial to, you know, nowadays the truth of the matter that the real estate business is in, is in the hands of the banking system. It doesn't belong to the people. Most of the people, they live in a house and they keep paying for a house three times more than the cost itself only to satisfy the banking system. When you build with exactly. credit, we can minimize the cost, we can teach people, and we can basically recreate a new industry by its own. And when we add the technologies of harvesting energies, regardless which it is, which it, which, whichever it is, either sun or 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 alloyed, alloyed or wind te technology, it doesn't yeah. matter. All we need just to have a battery that will assure that when all this fail, we can assure that our people can have a comfortable house and assure that it will be better than the construction method that we're doing. So 
we give to the governments only one problem, only one problem. You just manage the water. Something that is a, is a complete, it's a complete different paradig 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 paradigm. Yes, uh, we need to embrace to move on. Yes. We are almost out of time, Ramon. Uh, if someone is interested in contacting you or getting involved with the Green Tiger Journal or any of your other activities, uh, uh, what's the best way someone can reach out and find you? Do you have website or email or? Yes, we we have <clears throat> we have um, uh, the primary company is Hemp Engineering hempengineering.com.au. I my email is ramon at hempengineering.com.au. And no, nonetheless, uh, I have learned throughout this time that I rather work with WhatsApp. WhatsApp is uh, more. I I know when you're sending me something is coming from you. When you are going into email, it's so much phishing. You don't even know. You don't know. You don't know. <laughs> That's true. WhatsApp is encrypted in on both ends, and we use WhatsApp and Signal in our clinic for our doctors to do telemedicine appointments with yes. medical marijuana patients. We're using yes. Signal and uh, WhatsApp because it's encrypted on both ends, and the server doesn't keep a record of it either. Yes. So, um, but, but more important, Paul, is that I know if you were yeah. sending me a message when you're going to email, it's you never yeah, know. Can, you never know. <laughs> well, I want to thank you for coming on, Ramon. Is there anything you'd like to say in closing to our audience or for posterity? Well, um, if I had the opportunity to send a message to the decision makers, politicians around the world on regards to the prohibition, it, you guys are surrendered. This cannabis is here to stay. It was long before you were here. It is the prohibition with trillions of dollars that have been invested to, uh, to pack the benefits of um, cannabis is not working. Therefore, you simply need to embrace the change. And the sooner, the better, because you are the only obstacles between the new world and this world that is dying. All right. Well, thank you, Ramon Granados with Hemp Engineering and uh, the Green Tiger Journal and so many other projects out there. I uh, hope I can see you at the NOCO Hip Conference here in about six or eight weeks. But for all our audience out there, uh, keep following us and work to restore hemp. Uh, that's right. And I see you um, I see you soon in our upcoming uh, expos, the Hemp Seeds yeah. uh, Expo, that you will be the uh, one of the speakers, featuring speakers. Yeah. It's yes. coming up like March 17th, I think, right? A 18th of March, yes. 18th, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank you very much. Love and